So some things that I've kind of done at my station and my station is, is about as small as it gets right now, but starting from the ground up, HFTA is the uh, HF terrain analysis comes with the Edgar Bell Island antenna book. Uh, here's the terrain in four directions from my place. You can see the um, scale. It goes out to about two and a half miles and it's like four, 500 feet, 400 feet from the ground on the scale there. So the dark blue line is the uh, terrain to Europe. Uh, the red line is the terrain to stateside. Uh, green would be South Pacific. And then the light blue is to JA. So obviously stateside Europe, uh, pretty spectacular. JA is pretty good, it's not, nothing bad. It's just not as amazing. And then of course, Pacific is pretty decent. So the whole point is to have the terrain work for me versus putting up gigantic, huge towers. Uh, here's an example of why that's important. I don't know if anybody's ever played with this, but um, the dark blue line on the left, if, if you can see my mouse here, Basically, you want to have more gain on it. This is just taken into an account of five element, 20 meter Yagi. And the blue one is plotted over my terrain at the, at the station to Europe at 90 feet. The red one is at 60 feet. You can see how the 60 footer gets a lot of the higher angle stuff also, which is not a bad thing. That's also a very good thing. But the green line is a flat totally flat terrain profile with a 150 foot tower with a five element Yagi on it. And the 60 footer at my place destroys it based off of this, uh, a 60 footer on flat <clears throat> versus everything else. It just kills it. So that's the reason we like hilltops. That's the reason we like dramatic drop-offs. Uh, it's a lot cheaper that way. Uh, it's also a lot windier. So there's a trade-off there. So, uh, from the ground up, I did a perimeter ground. This is the, very like literally the first day of construction five ground rods tied around the shack base with two inch copper strap the generator ac mains eventually goes to one ground rod and then coax entries tied to another ground rod and then the switching wall and the, all that stuff goes to the same one so they're all on the same the same ground system which is super crazy important uh if you've read ward silver's book uh you should it describes in detail why that's important so starting from scratch, I can do it right the first time. So filtering, since we're not doing towers right away, filtering is something I can do. I took this picture last weekend. Um, this is the newest upgrade to my switching wall, which is very temporary because it's just on MDF. Uh, it'll be something a little better eventually, but uh, AC filters aren't pictured, but I'll get to that. Uh, I have some high power bandpass filters on the left and high power triplexer. That's these guys right here. Uh, in the middle is my uh, two by eight switch. So two radios go into one antenna switch. Uh, it is not an antenna genius and I'll get to the reason why. But the big black boxes are 5v4 AGN filters. I have two sets, I actually never used them. I just built them. Two Anderson power pole strips, two by MOAS, which will be uh, talked about later. This is the most important part of the station other than the antennas. This switch right here, which I just built two more this evening, is a W9KKN and N1C receive switch. I've kind of used it for a purpose it's not intended for, but it helps switch my uh, receive antennas. This black box is common mode chokes for the uh, receive antennas. And then this is the bias T output for my receive preamp that goes to one of my beverages right now. So we'll get to that stuff. So filtering is, is kind of the topic here, I guess. Uh, here's a good example of generator running with no filtering. If you look at the left-hand side, 160 meters, it's 10 to 20 over nine. This is, as K7NT can attest, this is not good. This is unusable for 160. And then on the 40 meter side, there is zero noise, but you can see it on the scope. And if I can see it on the scope, it's covering a signal up and I don't want that. But I'm on preamp two on 40 meters with no noise and I'm still seeing the noise. Unfortunately, I didn't take an after photo because I didn't think about it, I was too excited, but I installed these guys. So I have a link at the last slide. Uh, GM3 SEK has a really cool website where he talks about filtering. And I just built these with parts on hand. So it's it's kind of cobbled together. But this is a uh, $12 EMI filter from Amazon. Not completely necessary. Guys say it's not necessary. I figured it couldn't hurt to put it on there. I think these are mixed 43 ferrite cores. Or they're uh, four inches in diameter. So they're big guys. And then uh, the number of turns is in the K9YC 
Joe Cook book, which I'll explain to you. But this just plugs into my generator. And that's the 121. Uh, I do have a 240 version also, but it takes the noise from S9 plus 20 on 160 down to eat gone. Uh, it's just atmospheric. So uh, very important, not just for generator, but also for actual AC mains. Uh, same thing. Uh, when I run power, I'll do the same thing. And if you have a place where you can do that, I suggest you do. It will make a difference. So here's the 5 v 4 AGN filters. This is just a six-band bandpass filter. It's nothing special, uh, but it's a kit. I've always wanted to build one. I could have paid, you know, twice as much for a pre-built one, but building stuff is lots of fun. So Bob uh, put these kits out again after not doing production for a while. So I built two of these. They're going to be for the receive antennas only, which is kind of a special use case. With multiple transmitters, uh, everything is an antenna the feed lines, the control cables, everything. So as much filtering as I can have is good. These will be for the in-band operating. Uh, we'll have two radios on a band at times uh, with separate antennas. And with multiple transmitters, you need to have as much as you can. So that's what that is. Super fun project. If you love wine and tour rights, go for it. There's about 650 billion of them. But it only took, I don't know, just a couple of days for each one. Uh, it's a cool project. You can't buy these anymore, but guys have them for sale uh, that never built them. So, and most of the time they're used for the transmit side between the radio and the amp. I have not needed it because the VA6AM filters are just really that good. So, common mode chokes. This is a good picture just so you can see what it is. The K9YC choke cookbook is something I look at all the time. If you've never looked at that, I suggest you do. Uh, he's basically tested every combination of core material and coax and everything, and then put it all in a nice little package and told you what to do and what not to do. It's very helpful. So this is, I think this was a 40 meter dipole. Actually, I still have it. Uh, that works fantastic. That choke is tuned to, four, I say tuned, it's optimized for 40 meters. So it's not really broad banded but I don't want my feed line radiating or getting any uh, interference from the other transmitters. So this, this helps that. And that I can be two radios on all bands, any band at any time, and I can't hear anything. So it's great. So these are also super cheap to make. That's just RG 400. The core I think was about $2, super cheap, better than paying 90 bucks to a uh, commercial guy. If you want a fancy box. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I was kind of, looking at weight being a problem. So I went this route and you also want them uh, open because heat can be a problem and it'll crack the, uh, the toy. So uh, it is the best thing I've done for my antenna performance so far. And you want to choke it at the antenna and also with the coax entry, if you can, the old hat to some of you guys, but uh, I noticed before and after was a major difference. Um, so this is what the beverage box looks like. It was kind of a proof of concept and a test that turned into permanent. These are little bitty cores and I used cat five cable that I stripped the total cost on these was each little round core was probably like 80 cents, but I made a whole bunch of them. And the box on the left, that's the one that was on the wall. There's two cores, the green ones and the blue ones um, on the left. One is for 40 meters. One is for 80 and 160. And I have them in series. So it theoretically blocks everything. These are for my low band ones, of course. And then I'll have on the right, I bought these really fancy Tupperware boxes at Target. That's all I could find. And uh, those are at the feed points of the beverages. And then also uh, before they come into the shack. So there's three of them on the, on the beverages. And they work. They work great. Before and after is night and day. Super simple way if you have a receive antenna, uh, makes a big difference, especially with multiple transmitters because you will have lots of problems if you don't. The other thing that we're doing is the MOAS. Uh, the acronym is Mother of All Switches, the Master of All Switching, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the YCCC is the Cal or the uh, California, the uh, Yankee Clipper Contest Club out in New England, mm -hmm. and they make some really cool stuff. K1XM and W1UE and some of these other guys uh, did a great job. At its most basic level, it's a relay driver. Each board does 64 relays. Uh, you can daisy chain up to 99 of these together. It has transmit inhibit for six different radios. It has amplifier outputs for six different radios. 
when I say infinitely configurable, I really mean infinitely configurable. You can do whatever you want with it. Easy to expand the logic they have into it for partner modes. We can have two radios on a band using the same antennas, automatically switching to a receive antenna and sharing all the antennas at any time on the same amplifier or separate amplifiers across as many transmitters as you want. Uh, and that's really powerful. You have the, the hardware to do it. Um, and it's all in that one little box. Uh, it's definitely not plug and play. You have to create a JSON file, which is pretty simple, but you can load a different file. So my station right now, I have two of them, uh, one for the transmit antennas, one for the receive antennas. Uh, you can see where I label them because they come in these um, 10 pin Phoenix plugs. So everything's the same. So everything at the station will be universal, theoretically. Uh, everything can plug in at different ports if I need to. If one of them fails, you can swap it out really fast with something else. I did have one chip fail because I'm a bonehead and I hot switched it, um, pulling stuff off. But if a chip fails, you just pop it out, put it back in. Very simple. Um, reliability is really important. So it's very versatile and it's small footprint and it's great. USB cable plugs into it. I don't have any antenna controls other than rotators on the desk. You don't even need that if you have computer control your rotors. Uh, but all the switching and everything is done through either the PC with your mouse or on a tablet. Uh, you can do both at the same time. I do like the uh, feel of real switches. There's just something kind of satisfying about clicking a switch or pushing a button. But we're trying the touch screen for now. So to kind of kind of give you a little overview of how that works, if I want to do a single op two radio, I load my SO two var file and it configure. I've pre configured it for how I want the switching to go, and it works. If we want to do multi single. I load that file up, and I don't have to change any hardware. It just does all the switching correctly automatically. You can do that for multi multi everything. That's kind of the power of it too. So on the bottom there is just a screenshot. Uh, this would be what it would be like for a single op with two radios. Uh, you can see on the left the green means that it's selected. And these with the red mean that they cannot be selected for transmit because they're receive antennas only. So right now on the left, I would be transmitting on the 80 meter USJA dipole and receiving on the European beverage. And then the preamp for the JA beverage would be turned on. That's the left side. On the right side, I don't even have all these antennas up, but I thought it was cool. This is switching for a 40 meter four square, transmitting on the Northeast one, receiving on the JA one with the preamp on. So this is all user configurable. On this side, you can see that the red is where the transmit antenna is pointing. And then the yellow is where the beverage is pointing. So you can see at a glance where you're transmitting and where you're listening. Uh, same on the right-hand side. Of course, you can change the maps on those. You can, I mean, you can change everything. So it was a little bit of work up front, but but it's it's super cool. And it receives everything from the logging program. So the downside is it doesn't really work without DX log or N1MM running but I'm probably not making QSOs if I don't have the logging program running. Or if I just wanna, you know, rag chew, I can just turn it on, it's, it hasn't been a big deal. Uh, so uh, this is a video, a, a screenshot of the touch screen. I just took this yesterday. This is a, just a little tablet that I bought. It'll work on any touch screen. And the GUI is not quite as impressive as the other one, but it gets the job done. But it's cool because it can be sitting right in front of you. If there's two of you, it can be right in the middle of you, or you can each have your own. It's it's pretty slick, and the delay on it is milliseconds. Uh, I don't know any delay at all. So uh, that's the antenna switching. Pretty powerful thing. Kind of excited to see what I can do with it. The next little bit, operating ergonomics. And the only thing that I really want to say here is I'm a tall guy. I need a desk that's not short. There's been a lot of studies at 30 inches of desk height is perfect. And we've tested that <laughs> a lot of places. And this is what I built too. It's made a big difference. Uh, and a deeper desk is always better than a, than a uh, you know, narrow desk. You'd be surprised how much stuff you're going to get stuck on that thing. So I built this, I don't know, a few months ago uh, out, of, out of some two by fours and whatever. The bottom shelf uh, has a battery backup on it and a 50 amp power supply. And then, of course, room to walk around the desk. That was a main design intentionally. And then uh, it, it needs to be strong. This thing will, this thing will last. It, it'll, nothing's breaking this desk. If it does, I don't know, what, I don't know what's going to happen.
Uh, but here's the back. I put stuff on the back side instead of on the top to free up more space. These are push to talk splitters, um, RCA cables. So I feed the radio into that. And then it goes into three other ports, one of the MOAS, one of the AMP. And then I have a uh, in-band partner mode box that the third one will go to uh, for a lockout. So that's mounted permanently. Of course, the power poles. Uh, this station is kind of semi-field day all the time. I set the inside up every time uh, just in case someone breaks in. I don't lose everything. But this and the monitor stands is a great way to save space. Of course, the uh, uh, ground bar. Um, you know, this strap is not ideal. It works. It's This is temporary, but... I also like having the power strip either on the bottom of the back or on the top. I chose the bottom this way just to get less clutter, uh, but that way it's not running across the, the walkthrough. Anyway, proof of concept has worked so far. If my antennas ever stay up, uh, that station won the 7QP last year, which was a whole lot of fun. I know a lot of you guys were on it. It was super fun. I would love to do it again this year. We'll see if I get on. And then in WPXCW, I uh, actually won the US Tribander single element category which is a cool category. You can only have a single single element, like a, a dipole or a vertical on the low bands and no receive antennas uh, and a uh, tri-bander. So that's a cool category. Separate sleeping shack at some point is going to happen. It's a little crowded. We can fit three people in there if we get comfortable, but it, it works. The little spider beam at 30 feet definitely plays. And I've learned plenty of lessons the hard way. But uh, the big thing I've learned so far is that doing things right the first time with the grounding and the shielding and bonding and filtering has made a big difference. So uh, anyway, 